Sejam bem-vindos ao terceiro dia do Aveiro Welcome Tech Week. Welcome to this third day um of the Aveiro Tech Week, an event working with technology, art and culture. We will now begin the first tech session dedicated to the subject citizens and cities, what lies around the corner. To open the session, we would like to call on stage Rick Estelio Dias from the Projects in City and the Plastic Artist Patricia J. Reis. Good afternoon and welcome to this session, the first session of many sessions of Aveiro Tech Week. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this beautiful room celebrates 140 years of existence and for those who are following us via live streaming in our YouTube channel. For today's session, we have on stage Patricia Reis. She's an artist, a digital artist, a media artist. She's been in the Createc event with an exhibition at the Santa Joana Museum that we were able to see here. We also have professor from ISCTE, Pedro Costa, 
Tracy Charity, project manager at Dublin City Council Culture Company, and also Jordi Valta, consultant at Projectes Barcelona. The session we moderated by Maria Vlahu. She's a founding member and executive director of the Acesso Cultura Association and author of the blog Museum on Culture. Thank you, Maria, for being here, for accepting this challenge. I would invite you to take the floor. Thank you. Maria, I don't know if you can hear me. We are not getting any sound from you, neither for the room or for people who are watching from home. I'd say we ha were having some technical difficulties. It's the problem with being the first ones this week. I don't know if the other speakers can hear Maria. Nope. Is your microphone on, Maria? You do. Okay.
we are trying to solve these technical difficulties it will just be another couple of minutes thank you We do apologize, but we are experiencing some technical difficulties that we hope can be resumed in the next 10 minutes. So I repeat, we're having technical difficulties and we will come back to the session in 10 minutes. Thank you.
got to be Timmy Jr. Jr. Yes. Okay. Very, very low. Okay, we are we are testing we are testing each one of you now to see if we can finally uh, kick off the session. So uh, if you yeah, I cannot hear you. I, I cannot hear the details of what you're saying. I mean, I hear your voice. Uh, I have my volume at the at the top, and I could hear you just a little. Yeah, and we can hear you perfectly. So uh, one problem down. Let's move to Tracy. Tracy, can you pass your sound, please? No. We can't hear Tracy. <laughs> Tracy, I'm sorry, but we are not listen listening you as well. <laughs> Can you can you repeat again the the, the, the test, Tom, please? Hear you. I you are your sound is very, very low. I have the sound turned up to four volume. Yeah, but we can now hear I you can now. Hear myself uh, an echo. Okay, but uh, uh, we can hear you now. Uh, that's good. We can manage then but the sound I? the sound on our side. Don't worry about that, that will be solved. Thank you very much. Pedro. Okay, but I, I'm also hearing myself an echo. I'm hearing myself back. Will okay, can, uh, you, can you test again, Tracy? Sorry. See, uh, sorry. I can hear myself in echo, so I hear what I say repeated back to me. Okay, I think that problem is will be solved as well. Okay. Uh, okay. Pedro, can we test? Can you test your sound, please? Pedro. Uh, si, si. Yeah, okay. It's good. Thank you very much. And finally. Okay. Okay. Os, os técnicos estão a, estão a resolver. Espero que, entretanto, okay. fique, fique resolvido. Uh, Maria. Vamos testar Sim, agora. Sim, conseguem ah, ouvir-me agora? Perfeitamente. Bem-vinda. Mas eu ouço a minha voz. Obrigada. Também. Sim. Então vamos, uh, vamos aguardar mais um pouco, só para ver se resolvemos esta situação e finalmente arrancar. Ok. E acabar com esta experiência fantástica que estamos todos <risos> a passar. Uh, Maria, uh, vamos arrancar então, uh, à medida que vocês forem falando, eles também vão ajustando uh, o som para vocês ficarem com a melhor qualidade. Uh, passo então a, a palavra, uh, without further ado, uh, Maria, the floor is yours. Uh, muito obrigada, Rui, Patrícia e a todos os presentes. Vou continuar em inglês. Ouço a minha voz, portanto... <laughs> Peço desculpa. Vou se ouvirem barulho porque hoje começaram obras no nosso prédio uh, e poderá haver algum barulho, mas eu não vou falar muito, não estou aqui para falar. Uh, so, dear friends, thank you for accepting the invitation to be with us today and really look forward to our discussion. The session Citizens and Cities, What's Around the Corner, will be dedicated to smart, sustainable, inclusive, resilient, and happy cities. And I thought, wow, what a promise. My first thought was that when we say that, the image in our head might be of something abstract. Cities are buildings, for instance. But it's life we're talking about. People, animals, plants, trees. It's the way we organize our life together in society. Then I went looking for definitions. What does smart, sustainable, inclusive, resilient, and happy cities mean? Definitions are not the Bible, but they help us create a common understanding, a common ground for our discussion. Thus, to make a long story short, what we shall be discussing is cities designed with consideration for social, economic, and environmental impact, cities with consideration for spatial, social, and economic inclusion, 
cities with the ability to absorb, recover, and prepare for future economic, environmental, social, and institutional shocks. Cities that use different types of electronic methods to collect data. So this is sustainable, inclusive, uh, et cetera, et cetera, smart, et cetera. Good practices of co-creation with citizens in the development of solutions for a public space. Challenges of society or innovative approaches in the context of cities. Before presenting our guests, and because this is um, not an e a subject I'm a specialist on, I would like to share with you something that got me truly thinking and had an impact in the way I see the work of those of us working in the cultural field. In its 2017 2020 document, the city of Helsinki declared that its objective was to be the most functional city in the world. One reads in the document, functionality is based on equality, non-discrimination, strong social cohesion, and open, inclusive ways of operating. Everyone feels safe in Helsinki. A functional city is based on trust. Safety and a sense of mutual trust and togetherness are a competitive edge for the city. The city is for everyone, the, field, the city is built together. Then discussing the city's uh, new public library, which opened in 2018, Tomi Laitio, the city's executive director for culture and leisure, said that. This, this progress from one of the poorest countries of Europe to one of the most prosperous has been an accident. It's based on this idea that when there are so few of us, only 5.5 million people, everyone has to live up to their full potential. Our society is fundamentally dependent on people being able to trust the kindness of strangers. So I'm joined here today by Jordi Balta, a consultant at Proyectus Barcelona, Patricia Reis, artist and a member of Ms. Balthazar Laboratory, a feminist hackerspace in Vienna, Pedro Costa, associate professor at, at ISCTE, and Tracy Garrity, project manager at Dublin City Council Culture Company. So Tracy, I would like to start with you and ask you, what is the specific goal of the city of Dublin and of your city council for culture? Okay, um, so uh, I am head of development in the Dublin City Council Culture Company. Um, we are a, a company owned by Dublin City Council and we operate buildings and and cultural programs. So our vision is a Dublin where culture connects everything and everyone. Um, and we do that by connecting people through conversations. Um, we start with conversations and we continually check ourselves through conversations. Um, we, we have a year-round programme of engagement, which is really listening, um, and it's called Tea and Chats. Um, and we do that pre-COVID, we did it in community centres um, and anywhere that people gather, people gather together. Um, and we asked them questions on what they thought about the place that they lived, the street that they lived, this neighborhood they lived in, and the city they lived in. Um, and it gave us lots, lots of really rich information. Um, everything from um, mobility, how they traversed the sister, the, the sister city, um, how they they engaged with their neighbor, neighborhood hood, um, and how they, they felt about the city that they lived in and, and its place in their lives. Um, so, so from that, we've created this model where those conversations inform the programs that we develop. And in that, we, we bring in internal 
internal working group of different sections within the team. And then we add in some external, external expertise. Then we go and we try it. And we ask the people who are participating to tell us what they think of it. We continue to listen. And then we start all over again. So it's a bit of a loop. You just keep doing loops. Um, so, so that's kind of the fundamental basis of how we do things. And out of that, we run a museum, a cultural community center. We're in development for, um, for a couple of new buildings. Um, and, uh, and we also run engagement projects and creative engagement projects um, in, in places in the community. Can't hear you. I'm sorry, Maria, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. OK. So I apologize. Tracy, thank you for what you shared with us. Uh, I especially like the fact that you are willing to listen. We've been discussing this a lot among colleagues in the last month, the necessity to listen and not just talk. And also the fact that you went looking for the people uh, you went to meet them at the places where they meet. You didn't expect them to come to you. So, uh, Jordi, you and Pedro as well, you have a vast experience on city projects at an international level. Which are the projects that inspire you and would you would like us to know about?
Uh, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and it's a pleasure to, to, to be with you. Um, so yeah, um, I, I work as a I work as a researcher and consultant. So you hear a lot of echo in my presentation. So hope you can hear me well. Um, so I work as a researcher and consultant, and I'm based in Barcelona, but I've also done work with uh, cities in different parts of the world. I will start by presenting a bit the general framework in Barcelona and trying to respond to to the uh, to the reflection that Maria was making first about what the main goal of, of the city. And I would say in the case of, of Barcelona, and of course I'm not representing the city, I'm just looking at it as, as an observer, it's probably difficult in a large city, or maybe in the case of, of Barcelona, to have a single goal that somehow summarizes what the city wants to achieve. Uh, however, I think there's a number of general frameworks that somehow provide uh, a direction for the city. And at present, um, I'd say there's, a, there's, there's what normally would be the four-year uh, governmental plan, which tends to be adopted a few months after the election of a new local government. Uh, this plan was being designed when uh, COVID struck uh, a year and a half ago. And of course, then uh, that ended up influencing the kind of reflections and the kind of, of responses. So in a way, what is the plan for the current uh, governmental plan of the municipality uh, is also the, the, the plan for the recovery in the post-COVID uh, context. And that includes a number of uh, major areas. And I'll, I'll, I'll just present these and then probably in the, in the following uh, elements of the conversation, I can also highlight where culture uh, connects to all of that. So there's uh, six major areas that are identified, including uh, developing a more resilient and diverse uh, economy, uh, strengthening the resources for social inclusion, and that includes areas like health and well-being, gender equality, migration, etc. Uh, the acceleration of the ecological transi transition in the face of the climate emergency, and, and that is something that uh, becomes very transversal. So it does not uh, address only aspects like mobility or energy and the, the policies that more, obvious, uh, more, more obviously have to do with this, but also a broader set of policy fields. The strengthening uh, of an educational, cultural and scientific city. And of course, that's where cultural aspects come more centrally, but there's also elements of culture that are spread uh, throughout other uh, dimensions of the policy goals. Um, a more friendly and safe city at neighborhood level and with a metropolitan vision. So everything that has to do with both the decentralization, but also the, the perspective of what happens not only in the city, but in the broader uh, metropolitan uh, agglomeration. And finally, uh, an open city with a digital administration. And I think what's also interesting to see and, and probably what uh, also might have resonances with developments in other cities is that there's been an increasing effort to connect all of these with the sustainable development goals and somehow, well, putting that work that is being done at the local level in the global perspective of global challenges and highlighting the importance of localizing the sustainable development goals and recognizing the important role of uh, local governments as the places where people might have access to basic services and where sustainable development, development can be uh, materialized. Thank you, Jordi. Uh, I, I'm not sure I understood well in the beginning. Uh, was this plan something that different executives in the municipality adopted? I mean, yeah, after the election, so this is... did this continue? Did they remain you know, committed? Yeah, so this was the result of a participatory process involving, of course, the municipality, uh, but also a broader range of agents. So both online and offline discussions involving many voices around the city that somehow contributed, contributed to these. And let's say this would have normally been adopted in the first few months of 2020, but then when it was in the process, there was the impact of COVID. So it ended up, uh, let's say the preparation period ended up being longer than originally planned and integrating uh, everything that has to do with the adaptation and recovery post-COVID. So, 
so yeah, it's both. Yeah, in any case, so yeah, it's it's the general framework of for the city's current policy. Right. Thank you. Pedro, what I know best, as you know, is your work regarding a cultural strategy for the city of Lisbon. You can talk about Lisbon or another city, perhaps, that inspires you in terms of how they develop their future plans. Hello, good afternoon to all. Uh, I think I also have here some echo that I don't, <laughs> that I, I don't know if you are hearing me well. Uh, I would like to thank the invitation to participate in this session and and probably to say my perspective on uh, more than pro collective um, uh, processes of uh, strategic planning for city councils, for several city, city councils in Portugal and other processes. And uh, maybe that experience can be sense that um, uh, not just in the culture, but in general, in terms of planning, uh, um, a vision about what uh, what has been the maybe the shift that we can see in the in the recent decades in strategic planning? Um, for instance, if we think in the case of Lisbon, there are a multitude of plans of strategic plans. Some of them, maybe plans that imply the this listing that Tracy was talking about and participation that uh, Jordi was also talking, but in some cases. They are just named strategic <laughs> and probably not maybe the with the methodologies of strategic planning. But uh, uh, passing through, this, I think a several uh, uh, a co a consistent set of, of plans uh, from a strategic chart to strategic plans in terms of culture, as you're saying, in terms of uh, of, uh, of uh, tourism of social dimension of uh, urban development these days. And uh, maybe the most important is that we have uh, in the 90s and uh, beginnings of this century uh, uh, based on the idea of centrality of the city in the, in the, the country and in the world and in the competitive affirmation of this linked to not just economic, cultural, and all dimensions. And we have been uh, assisting to a shift that is much more oriented now, most of the strategic documents, to the ideas of openness, of diversity, of tolerance, of a cosmopolitan city. And so this, uh, at least in terms of narrative and, and in, ter in, in terms of rhetoric, has been uh, assuming the, the, the central place, for instance, in the cultural strategic plan, but also in others. At the same time, there is also a shift in terms of, um, of, of our concerns of, of the planning to the governance issues, to the idea that uh, it's important to articulate policies, to have transversal policies in terms of uh, to action of the citizens. And so the, in the own objectives of the strategic planning is the process of planning and the involvement of people and involvement of, of different stakeholders in the city. And that is also assumed uh, in, the, in the plans. However, in spite of this, what, what, what I think it's also interesting to think is that particularly in the recent years, maybe this strategic vision and this strategic uh, kind of orientation is um, articulated with the, the European agendas or the, also the SDGs, as, as Jordi was saying, objectives or the international process that have conditioned all the, the um, rhetoric and because condition all the funding, all the green, digital, uh, digital, and so on uh, aspects that are 
essential in this um, in this agenda, in the affirmation of the agenda, and maybe what we is what we see is that we have we are turning to a point in, in, in which at least at some in in some occasions and in some forms we have less strategy or less and more operationalization of these agendas. The strategy is simply the translation of these agendas, of the rhetoric of these agendas, or the rhetoric of the funding mechanisms to the uh, to, 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 to the strategic documents. And so the intelligent city, the inclusive city, the resilient city, the happy city that Maria, we were talking about, uh, they are all there because we need to put it there, but I'm not sure if the uh, or because for, for every that smart cities, maybe we should have smart people, and and for every smart people, <laughs> we need several things that we can discuss later, probably. <laughs> yeah. You and Pedro and uh, and Jordi as well, um, because you mentioned tourism, which used to be a huge goal in many city plans. Have we learned anything? Do you feel there is a shift there in considering tourism in a more sustainable and humane way? Are you asking me that, uh, Maria? Because um, I was you, you, can, you because you mentioned tourism, sound. Pedro, but Jordi yes, 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 can sorry. come in just, as well. No, no, I, it's just because the the lack of uh, sound lack is here. Um, I think we, we first for tourism several in Portugal and in several cities and also in at the, of the region in Portugal in Lisbon. Uh, that uh, is different of having a strategic perspective, and also to think strategically in terms of um, what is the the action in the the daily daily routines of of the of the city of the planners and of the of the citizens of course uh, me particularly for instance being involved in the cultural strategy for uh, for lisbon were yeah, that were points related to tourism and uh, probably if we do the accountability of what was done what and what was not done and what was and even what would be more important to have been de, been done after that with all the changes that the city uh, with all the pressure of the tourism but if if you feel with this accountability i think this this would be the area where probably the results are worst and uh, there is not uh, a, a comprehensive and integrated approach to solve the problem of tourism and to use culture to solve the, 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 the problem. Of course, the tourism has all the potential. We have to, the tourism is essential for the development of the city of Lisbon, for instance, and several other cities. But of course, there are many problems related to that. And uh, the solutions and including the use of culture, culture in this has been more uh, problematic than solving things. Culture has been often instrumentalized, just instrumentalized to 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 develop tourism, or at least the short short term results in terms of tourism. Yeah, Jordi, would you like to add something? No, I mean, I think I think that that discussion is very important, and of course, it's it's one which uh, in cities like like Barcelona, as well as in Lisbon and and others, has been has been very present. And I think, uh, let's say, the sustainable tourism is there more in its course than in than in practice. Uh, in a way, let's say, the, the COVID crisis has somehow accelerated and made more evident the, the challenges that were uh, already there. And and I think there's good practices at small scale in say in terms of uh, projects that are somehow decentralizing tourism trends and. And that, of course, uh, there is uh, there are pockets of, of tourism or, or tourists that are interested in exploring other forms of uh, 
engagement with the local communities and visiting different places and, and exploring things differently. But of course, there's a lot of inertia from what is the traditional tourism model, which is connected to uh, uh, economic interest and so on. And that's very, that's very difficult to, to change. I mean, I think one, uh, one, one thing that I also wanted to, to add and which somehow connects to, to what uh, some of the reflections Pedro was making about the importance of the, of the transversal uh, governance is how uh, often within the city you have interests that are opposed between different policy fields. And in the case of the, the current government, in, in local government in Barcelona, for instance, they're separate areas dealing with culture and on the one hand, but then another one which deals with uh, creative industries and tourism. And somehow they represent slightly different and often opposed uh, interests. And it's difficult uh, to find some cohesive approach there. So that's, that's one of the challenges and somehow somehow also represents the, the different perspectives, some policy interests more in the shorter term, others in the long, longer term, and, and the difficulty sometimes in, in reconciling that. Uh, the, the other thing that I wanted to add on, on the basis of some of the earlier reflections is, is the importance of uh, challenging some of the policy terms that we take for granted or that we use often without necessarily considering what they mean. And with regard to, to the notion of smart city, for instance, one of the things that came to, to mind is, is, I think it's the latest book by uh, Richard Sennett or one of his latest books where he somehow distinguishes, you know, he calls a prescriptive smart city, which uh, and a prescriptive is the one in which everything has been prepared for the citizens to follow a particular model. And let's say everything is pre-programmed and there is very little that is expected from citizens, but everything in a way is to be done by technology for them. And, and he opposes this with what he, he calls the coordinative smart cities. And the, the coordinative smart city is the one that requires citizen participation and expects that that smartness comes from uh, the grassroots and from the population through forms of uh, open debates and access to open data and so on. So, and, and that is one form of a smart city. But it, it's not always the one we assume when we think of a smart city, but let's say seeing that that smartness can lie in who designs the city or on the citizens uh, at, at broader level, I think it's, it's, it's an important that's a great cue to move on to Patricia. Uh, Patricia, you are part of a feminist hacker space in Vienna. And my question is, what is the role of citizens in all this, in planning the future of a, of a city? And should they wait for, a, for an invitation to participate? Uh, hi, Maria. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I was listening uh, careful to all of your suggestions and I think maybe it would be interesting to just point out there's not one plan, not one strategy, right? There's many different perspectives and we should try to, um, to cover as much f ground as possible. And I think it's, that's possible if we give voice to local communities. I have some questions regarding local authorities and governments because sometimes rather than giving the empowering communi communities they are actually you know sort of like in a way uh, might be um, uh, oppressing um, and I think what is important when it comes to technology in the cities is actually to um, make available simple tools uh, where citizens uh, can uh, be creative so they can actually participate and we know that it's a, a very beautiful thought and very difficult to put in practice. <laughs> and there's not uh, for sure uh, one strategy from one artist. I think it should be really like a community-based um, project. So from our side at Miss Balthazar, we are focused on um, in this like very specific intersection between art, gender, technology, and uh, science. And um, we, we look to technology uh, for many different reasons, but with 
a critical, uh, let's say, understanding of social structures when it comes to using technology in our everyday life, but not only. And um, yeah, and uh, so on one hand, like trying to establish or to create awareness within communities that do not have access to that knowledge. On the other hand, to um, try to create what we call safer spaces. So there's not such a thing as a safe space, but uh, rather like a place where people that are um, excluded from um, or felt excluded from uh, places or um, occasions and events where technology and science is uh, taught that can uh, come forward and express themselves freely and experiment freely. So also, so it's like on one hand, like using technology has um, a critical strategy to create awareness uh, for uh, people or communities or citizens that do not see that other side of technology, that they, are, uh, they position themselves more as users, consumers, and not as makers or creatives. And on the other hand, within our community, also looking to who is behind all these smart, let's say, um, politics, and who is behind all these technologies that are actually changing the world, right? And, uh, and uh, we, we want to propose a more diverse, and uh, we want to fight you know, gender inequality, but also privilege inequality. So uh, we all know that mainly, uh, let's say, in, uh, around the world, um, the majority of the creatives or that are behind development of programming and also electronics and all this uh, uh, sort of like research, tech research, uh, they are um, white male, let's say normative um, uh, people. So we want to shift that also within the art field and, uh, and especially approaching communities with that critical uh, perspective. Patricia, would you like to talk with specifically about one of your projects? Uh, yeah, so it, I mean, I'm also an artist that try to somehow see things a little bit more uh, critical when it comes, you know, also with this idea of demystifying technology, we say. So it's like open up the black box, looking what is inside, or unraveling this complexity of programming, electronics, etc. But the, at, in uh, our space at Miss Balthazar, we try, uh, we, we, we have uh, several actions. One of them is um, an exhibition program where we give visibility to only non-binary artists. Uh, so um, artists that identify themselves as uh, female or trans or queer in the form of a solo show. And they work within these topics like art, science, technology, and gender. And on the other hand, we offer workshops for free also uh, for uh, this community. And these workshops are uh, about many different uh, things, not only programming and electronics, but, but let's say open source tools for empower empowerment and emancipation. So it could be a nice technique to, uh, to give you the autonomy to fix your own computer or your own phone, or to be able to program your uh, website. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patricia. Before I move on to the next question, I would like to go back to Tracy and ask uh, if technology plays a role in your work in Dublin and what kind of role? Um, yes, I mean, like everybody, technology is a huge part of, of our day to day, um, particularly over the last 20 months um, and continues and it's actually a, con a continuous conversation at the moment as we're in this hybrid space um, but we did a very significant data tech project called the cultural audit and map um, within the cultural strategy and the city development plan for 2016 through to 2021 one of the um, actions and the objectives was an up-to-date cultural infrastructure um, audit of the city. Um, and again, back to the, the tourism question, there was a number, of, a number of discussions going on in the political and cultural arena around the disappearance of um, cultural venues, availability of space for artists, 
um, residencies, um, you know, the explosion of the private and um, and and commercial, um, you know, tourism accommodation economy within the city, um, and all of the challenges that that presents itself. Um, so we we started out doing thinking it was going to be you know it, it would be the usual kind of cultural audit and then we said no actually it needed to be bigger and broader than that um, and it would be everywhere that culture took place so not just city council or local authority or institutional but again all of the places where people carry out cultural activity um, and then it would be open source. It would um, sit independently with us, but it would integrate into the GIS system of the of Dublin City Council. And um, so it could inform the various departments across in terms of their own planning. Um, and and then it could be used. The data set can be used by anybody who wishes. Um, and it was designed so that it could give you very specific information, uh, which was aligned with kind of smaller area codes to do with um, electoral areas so that you can pinpoint it within streets, but not obviously compromise GDPR of community groups and various individuals. Um, and so that has been used now for a number of, of projects within um, Smart Dublin. Um, tourism Ireland, Fulcher Ireland, the national kind of tourism body, and then the international, the kind of the internal tourism market and the external tourism market um, agencies. And um, and we're, we also use that ourselves in terms of our own projects and our own activations within communities. Um, so that, that's one element. Um, and then on, on a much more kind of fundamental and basic um, we always we had a project called Culture Club, um, which came about from people telling us they had no connection to the national cultural institutions in the city. They saw them as being national, the realm of of um, of international tourists or to the tourism, and not really speaking to a city or a local need. That they were, you know, that this isn't really where it's if you were in a town and there was a museum, it speaks to the local town. But when you're in a, when the capital city, it speaks on a national level. So how do you bridge that gap? Um, and all of these institutions have outreach programs and engagement programs, but again, they're about they're about a place, a thing in a place that you have to walk in a door to go and see. So we mm -hmm. challenge that um, and uh, we invite people. We go into the community to invite them. We have a friendly face who meets them. They get a curated visit and conversation and the curator must come and talk to the people, the great unwashed, after the after the, the visit. Um, but COVID obviously put pay to that because we couldn't meet people in places. And we moved online. Um, our culture clubbers were very happy to move online. They embraced Zoom with a passion and were um, and would say things like, it's the only thing I, I have in my life that is not about am I cocooning Am I shielding? Am I at home? My family talking to me like I am a five-year-old about shopping and staying indoors, etc. It's the healthy adult converse, conversation. Um, and for our cultural partners, it meant that they had to embrace a way of thinking about their buildings and their collections without having access to them. And um, that was a tricky conversation in the beginning. But they embraced it pretty quickly. And now the challenge is some of our active participants have kind of moved back into a more kind of passive audience space. 
um, and some of our cultural partners have forgotten about the person it, person to person interaction. So that's the that's the hybrid space, and that's the challenge at the moment. Um, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, but at the same time, I would like to remind the people that are following this discussion that we'll try to leave at least 10 minutes in the end in, if you want to make uh, questions or comments. So please think about it now. So I would like, my next question is, what is the role of culture uh, when planning a city's future, a city's strategy? Uh, Pedro somehow already touched on this, saying that many times culture is instrumentalized. I don't know, Pedro, would you like to be the first to comment on this? What is the role of culture? Um, of course, culture tended to be instrumentalized in the process, in this process, because the culture all these years, these recent years, as uh, the instrument for everything, for economic growth, for education, for expression of the minorities, for the participation, for tourism development, for environment and quality and general. And of course, culture fulfills all this, can be an instrument for all this. But also, of course, culture is an end in itself, and of cultural policies should address that. So, having said this, uh, I think there is a room for, in this cultural strategy, to have transversality, as we have been talking, and, and, and this includes also transversality in terms of funding, in terms of objectives, in terms of motivations and articulation of the agents. Uh, but on the other hand, also, to have transversality not policies with uh, culture and using culture as the cement for the several policies and for the changing of perspectives and the changing of mentalities. Um, for instance, the, the idea of having um, an openness, uh, a tolerant society and all the aspects that in Unfortunately, in, in the, the, we have been assisting in, all over Europe and, not, uh, and everywhere, not just Europe. Um, we have here a role of culture that is fundamental. And for that, I think I, I would take back something that uh, Patricia was saying, because culture can be, if the, I think there were very good examples of that, because uh, culture can be the way where we can uh, devolve, uh, uh, develop these smart cities, uh, for instance, providing space, safe spaces for expression, or for instance, to provide spaces of experimentation and creativity, not just in the cultural field, but, but transversal to all. That this, this, um, is something that is embedding and transforming the skills that people need to be all those things that you were referring in the in the beginning, uh, Maria, to be happy, to be resilient, to be sustainable, and so on and so on and so on. And those spaces are many times not so available in society, uh, even this. But when we don't talk about arts, but we think, for instance, it's participatory mechanisms and empowering communities, uh, they are not there. And even if the tools are there, there are uh, many times many obstacles, many problems in the processes, in the mechanisms that do not feel safe, do not feel um, interested in experimenting, motivated to experiment, uh, able to express ideas, and culture is essential on this, I think. On this. Another dimension, I think it's important, is also in the promotion of uh, the culture of civility, that uh, we can be several times advancing to a 
smart city with all the, all the technology, all the things. But uh, civility lacks in the people, and culture could be an a, a, a instrument to try to change mentalities and behaviors on that level. Uh, for instance, <laughs> this morning, it is not a critic in Lisbon again, but when I when I came out house and to, 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 there were two scooters, or those electric scooters, parked in the in the um, in the walk in front of it. So everyone, we have the technology, but we don't have the civility to put the the scooter when when we went to use it. To be in the right place, not in the middle of the of of the walk, where the people walk and where the people and where the, for instance, the, the issues of accessibility are. are yes, I lost Pedro there for a second. I think, Jordi, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, yeah, about the the importance of culture in these uh, in addressing these situations. Uh, I wanted to talk about the, the work of one of the organizations I've worked with uh, over the years, which is an international network of local authorities and local governments called United Cities and Local Governments, which is, say, the main international network of local authorities. And uh, through its Committee on Culture, uh, United Cities and Local Governments has been advocating for many years uh, what is uh, called uh, culture as the fourth pillar of sustainable development. So understanding that uh, in addition to the economic, the environmental and the social dimensions of sustainable development, cultural aspects are essential in themselves, which is in a way uh, 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 um, a kind of discourse that tries to prevent culture from being seen exclusively as an instrument for the achievement of other goals, because it says uh, culture is as important as the other goals that societies uh, define for themselves, which of course doesn't detract the fact that through culture you can achieve uh, or you can cont contribute to goals in fields like the generation of employment or social inclusion, etc. But that that is not what is central. Now that understanding of culture as something that has a validity in itself, culture as an end in itself, can also be linked to the importance of cultural rights, uh, the understanding that we all have a right to take part in cultural life, and that that is as important as other human rights, and that's recognized as such in international documents on, on human rights. Um, I think that centrality of cultural rights, I think in some cities coexists with the discourses uh, or the approaches that might be more instrumental. I mean, that's, I think that's inevitable in complex cities, uh, that overlapping of different finalities is, is, exists. And for some, uh, instrumentalis instrumentality will be central and for the others it will be other things, but that's, that's, that's the reality. I think what that means in practice is, for instance, and, and that's something we see in different cities, and I think probably many of the cities that have worked with United Cities and local governments. Barcelona is one, but there's many people, cities across Europe, in Latin America, in Dublin, among others, has also been connected in a way uh, to some of the work of uh, United Cities and local governments. So, for instance, elements like the decentralization of opportunities to take part in cultural life, an awareness of the inequalities that uh, limit ability of people to take part in cultural life, which can have to do with uh, physical access, uh, with the price, with the perception of cultural institutions as not being for, for you, and so on. So, so being aware of that and working to address that, that, and that also has to do with being better at managing knowledge, and let's say you, you're working better with researchers and working with open data, and so on, and finding ways to uh, manage that knowledge in a way that allows to identify what are the obstacles to effective participation. I think that's that's important. And also the understanding that taking part in cultural life is not exclusively 
attending cultural activities or visiting cultural venues, but also has to do with having a say. So what Tracy was mentioning earlier about the politics of listening and actively engaging people is, is, is part of uh, taking part in cultural life because it's having your say and contributing to shaping that cultural life in, in a way that makes sense to the plurality of people that, 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 that coexist or that who live in a city. Uh, the, the, the last thing that I wanted to say here, and, and that also uh, has echoes with uh, some of what uh, Pedro was saying, is uh, one of the lacks that we, or one of the weaknesses that we are often observe within cultural policy, which is the fact that we know culture is something that is very broad, but then when we uh, effectively design cultural policies, often we focus on the arts and heritage rather than aspects that have to do with values, with lifestyles, and so on. So then say, uh, of course, culture has a lot to say to address the climate uh, transition. It has a lot to say to, get, to guarantee conviviality within cities, but often that lies outside the scope of what uh, departments in charge of culture will, will do. And finding ways for that more transversal uh, place of culture across city, across um, policies, somehow broadening the scope of cultural policy. And, um, and, and I think that there's also something that we could learn from policies in other parts of the world as well. So in some Latin American cities, often there is a there's a stronger continuity between contemporary culture and traditional ways of life and, and the, the aspect that have to do with values and the more tangible expressions of culture. And, and, and I think there's spaces, there's elements there that we could learn in terms of somehow uh, breaking some of the boundaries of how we understand cultural policy. Which, uh, which Latin American city do you have in mind? Can you refer one or two? Um, I, I mean, I was thinking, for instance, of Bogota and Medellin in, in Colombia as uh, cities that have, a that have discussed very uh, in depth what sustainability means and let's say how the civic values uh, can somehow are, are part of the cultural terrain and need to be addressed within cultural policy and so forth. But I think in, I mean, potentially in Mexico City, there's some interesting elements in that, and, and I'm sure in other places. Okay, thank you, Jordi. Well, we, we're trying very hard in our um, conferences and other meetings with colleagues to remind ourselves that culture is not just the arts, it's more than the arts. We tend to focus on that ourselves. But still, uh, the arts are culture as well. So I would move on to Patricia and ask, what do you see the role of art to be in the strategic plan of a city? Thinking that um, actually I see art and culture as a tool, so for me, it's clear that it's it's supposed to be in instrumentalized. Uh, the question is more like for to serve which purpose, right? So uh, it could be either for political manipulation or propaganda, as we've known since uh, many years, or it could be to emancipation and to actually offer uh, freedom and 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 to social change. And. Um, it would be also maybe interesting now to make, uh, make a mention here to Avairu in particular because we are having an part uh, of a festival that is happening now, which is an um, art and technology festival called um, Kriatek. So this, at the moment in this uh, uh, city, and this was for sure like something that it was initiated by the municipality, uh, but it's a very diverse program that gives uh, to artists the possibility to have their own critical perspective towards technology. And at the same time, these exhibitions are spread all along the city and they invite uh, the public, the expert public and the non-expert public to just come and visit and be part of it. And I guess this is a very good example of a strategy that, you know, rather than just like imposing culture, we are sort of like has a, Tracy said, used this word, I like it very much. It's more about inviting people to be part of it because they, most of these projects, they do not work without the public. They are participatory uh, projects. So they, the, they need the public to function. And I think sometimes 
and uh, or rather that um, this, um, let's say, uh, intersection between art and technology might be indeed um, a very good um, recipe to, um, in order to uh, the, the viewer, the participant, the spectator to feel as part of the artwork, as part of the, um, of the event, of the performance of, yeah, so uh, another example I would like to mention, it's also from Austria, the Ars Electronica uh, Festival exists since many, many years and it's a very good example how this community from Upper Austria and also from around the world somehow, but especially this more conservative part of Austria is now so much more aware of the impact of technology. And I just remember while we were talking that this year they had a very interesting, many different slogans around the city, uh, has an advertisement strategy for the festival. And one of them was, um, um, in English would be something like, um, um, some people believe fake news, others, the others go to Ars Electronica. So it's a little bit, you know, a very interesting a slogan, I think, uh, which is somehow triggering this curiosity and, and also like um, a discussion about what is behind all these very complex apparatus of the internet, right? So uh, again, inviting the community to be, partic uh, to be uh, participants, active participants of the discussion rather than just consumers. And I think this is really important and culture has definitely a very important role in that regard. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you all. I would ask now if any of the people following this discussion would like to make a comment or question. I see a hand from here. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Alexandra Teid. I'm here from Aveiro, and I thank you very much for these contributions. They are all very interesting, and although technology uh, didn't cooperate at the beginning, now uh, it's fantastic. So, um, I wanted to, to mention a project here with Aveiro Tech City. It's called uh, Cidadania Lab. It's a civic lab, and we started um, one year ago. So it's a, a project about participation, and um, we involved um, 356 participants in this uh, lab, um, and it's about a collaborative problem-solving uh, process. So um, it was very interesting. And it's a mechanism, a participatory mechanism. And the question is, and also, so we involved many participants, and there were six civic projects created by citizens. So they created possible solutions, they tested them, and they created six civic projects. And um, so the question is, uh, what about uh, civic labs in your cities, in your countries? Do you know? I know some, and uh, for instance, in Barcelona. Um, but I wanted to hear you about civic labs. And uh, what do you think about uh, this uh, participatory mechanism? What do you think about uh, participatory processes? Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandra. Who would like to answer Alexandra's question? I mean, for, for us, per participatory processes and, and problem solving is a every day. We, we're a living lab of it. Um, you know, we, we at every project, um, and it's continuous, and we add in layers and layers when we think we need more participation and more experts and more individual contributions. 
all the time. And we do that whether we're running an artistic project, whether it is a community neighborhood project, whether it's a museum, whether it is, um, you know, designing a space for, um, you know, for the culture and creative industries in the city center. We, we do this as a matter of course. Um, I mean, there are other participatory networks that have been implemented by, by government. There are legislative um, requirement for all local authorities. Um, and I have a, you know, I, there are gatekeepers and some of them work very well and some of them don't work well at all. Um, um, and they were designed in order for the, for there to be representation from different sectors and and different different community voices, um, and you know it depends on who's minding the ship, in order as to whether it is operates cohesively or not. Um, but yet there are a number of civil civil groups within the city, who operate um you know, a, a, across a number of disciplines. Um, and um, and and down the the Docklands, there's a number of dog patch and various other civic tech labs that 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 operate in that kind of private public space. Thank you, Tracy. Jordi, would you like to add? Uh, yeah, it's 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 not it's not an area. Um, I'm very, very familiar with, but definitely in Barcelona as well as in other cities in the last year, in the last five, six years, there's been a push for renovating the mechanisms of participation, particularly through online uh, mechanisms and uh, yeah, online processes that are combined with some offline uh, exchanges and quite a lot of openness to discussing uh, a wide range of uh, policies, whether it's sectorial policies, so now say uh, plans around the climate are currently being uh, planned, but also some neighborhood initiatives or let's say regeneration uh, projects for particular areas. And then also, for instance, over the last few months, uh, the process of the participatory budget has also had an interesting combination of online and offline aspects. So I think Overall, that's contributing to broadening uh, mechanisms for participation. Um, I think the, the, the issue of the gatekeepers that Tracy was mentioning uh, is an important one to what extent uh, there are some people that have easier access to that kind of mechanisms and how you compensate for that by uh, establishing complementary channels that allow for people to take part. And then I suppose um, you also need to find smart ways in which to combine um, online participation that is individual with spaces for collective deliberation and so on. Because of course the, the technological tools allow for collective uh, decision making and collective de deliberation, but sometimes they are organized in a way that basically uh, channels individual participation and I think managing and curating those mechanisms in a way that balances the individual and the collective and which is truly inclusive uh, is, is some of the basic criteria if you would expect. Thank you, Jordi. Pedro, you wanted to add something as well? Uh, just, just say something. I, I think it's fundamental, all the, the, the participatory process and the way they are I think it's uh, very interesting in many, many countries and the potential and also the potential with the, the technologies are enormous with that uh, for social change and for the social, uh, the change of the governance forms that we are used to in planning. Um, but, on, but on the other side, I, I see here there are two, two things that should address that are important to think in uh, many times with this process. One is the is related to what both of the of Tracy was saying, but uh, we're saying, uh, but it's the risk of uh, instrumentalization of these processes. Um, on one hand, because people are not effective, most of the time people are not empowered 
uh, and not uh, and don't not have the skills to participate fully, and so there are some kind of persons uh, or other kind of mediators that assume the protagonism in these processes. And for instance, in Portugal, that is clearly visible. All the participatory uh, mechanisms through the country are many times uh, mobilized by the same persons. And with the, and so it's that that is a risk. Clearly, the other one it's related to this. I think it's related to the funding or the funding of mechanisms because it it seems to me, and I'm not uh, completely involved in this, and so maybe this can be a problem of of the, the, my point of view. But it seems that most of these processes are fully dependent of uh, funding that is decided by public authorities at different levels. And um, the sustainability and the resilience of these mechanisms after the point of decision of the ones that decide these budgets to, to make available or not this money for these, uh, for these processes or for these incentives that we have, for instance, in Portugal, we have the BPD program, for instance, in Lisbon or other. Um, I think it's a challenge to how to make this resilient, these processes. But I think Overall, the, the important thing maybe is that to assume that in the, all these projects we have a diversity of interests, of motivations that are different in the people that are here, and we should also we should look to that without uh, without dramatizing it and assuming that they are perfectly legitimate and are people uh, with different interests. They are moving uh, their the world in the in the sense of their expectations and negotiating it but we should be aware of that and now we i don't know if that yeah you froze so yeah. i wasn't sure if you finished oh, no, or... just, just saying the, the <laughs> thing the last thing is that be aware that the power that they have is not the same and they have an even power the re, all these people in these relations in these processes Thank you, Pedro. I hope, uh, Alexandra, these were satisfying answers to you, for you. Uh, we are running a bit late because of the initial technical problems, so I would, I would like to wrap up here to thank our guests. Sorry to interrupt Tracy, you. Tracy, Patricia. Sorry to interrupt you. We just have one final yep. question. If you don't mind, just one more question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, a short one, please. We Thank you, Patricia. Oh, okay. No. Okay. Now, yes, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Good afternoon mm -hmm. to all. Uh, I would like to question um, Patricia. Uh, I would like to know about it. Uh, how do you know your view about the art and how uh, you view this this? the person can be part of the event or part of the art. Uh, how is this feeling for you or this emotion? Yeah, because I have been studying how inter artist intervention can improve the public spaces. So I would like to, to know your view about it, about, it. Uh, about this feel, yeah, this feeling. And if you someone can tell something about it, this too. Yeah, uh, how the community or the neighborhoods or peoples of the city can feel the can feel part of this event, of part of this art, of part of this all of this, yeah, of the Aveiro Techie Week. How you, is your view about it? This feeling or this emotion or all of this, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's two possible answers really shortly. <laughs> uh, on a, a level of a micro scale, <laughs> as an artist, I, I like, I work with perception. So for me, it's a human centered, uh, um, uh, let's say artwork. And my interfaces invite people to be part of it and participate. And sometimes it's really, because it's so focused on perception and also like the way you feel, it's so difficult to translate it into into words, right? So it's uh, also difficult to make the citizen science with it to take conclusions. Or the, 
on the macro level uh, scale of the festival, I think it's, um, it's, it's a cultural, let's say, I guess Avaru has started um, in the past years with these initiatives to engage the community and to expand it um, uh, beyond the city. And uh, I guess it will take, or it, it, it needs some effort and will take, will take more effort to uh, be able to, um, to invite more people or also to people to feel invited in that sense. So I, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, if it's, not, I'm not sure if I understood very well the feeling situation. Maybe you can reformulate that a bit. It's <laughs> you managed to wrap it up, Patricia, thank you. But I'm sure since you're physically there, you can discuss it a bit further. So thank you again, uh, Patricia, Tracy, Jordi and Pedro. I thank also the organization for inviting me to moderate this session and all of you who were with us today interested in this subject. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you very much to all the speakers uh, in this session. And thank you, despite of all the uh, technical issues in the beginning. But I think at the end, it was a very profitious session with great um, thoughts shared among us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, changing to uh, Portuguese, uh, vamos só, um, encerrar esta, esta so sessão, we are about to close this session, uh, Aveiro, the first Tech session week, of Aveiro Tech Week, dos dois, uh, uh, where the announcement of the two winners of the artistic Kriatec, residences Criatec, and, and before I invite Patricia to announce who the winners are. Let me just tell you that it is the second edition of this program that seeks to bring closer the development of STEAM skills in artistic production. For these two editions, we had more than 40 participants coming from different countries. Within a training component, we involved our partners, ESAD, and also the University of Aveiro. But there is a very strong component and very interested in directorship. We have two invited artists for the first edition, Carry the Moo and Michael Dean. And now for the second edition, it was very timely. We had the active participation and cooperative of Patricia Reis, to whom I would like to thank for getting involved in such a positive manner. And I would like to give the floor to Patricia. I don't know if you want. Apesar de eu não ter estado e não ter feito parte da última edição, mas tivemos um, um, muito pouco tempo para produzir um, projetos. Portanto, foram as residências que tiveram a duração de seis dias apenas, uh, com 20 participantes, uh, muitas ideias, muita experimentação, muito ativo. Portanto, começando todos, começámos todos os dias às nove da manhã, acabámos quando, quando não era possível estar mais no edifício. Uh, e, claro, os participantes levaram ideias e os projetos para casa. Portanto, foi um momento muito intensivo. E há muitos projetos que ficaram por, uh, por terminar ou porque as ideias dos participantes são muito ambiciosas e o nosso espaço foi muito curto, ou porque as ideias, de facto, são ambiciosas, muito interessantes, mas não existia um budget uh, 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 disponível naquele momento para a produção. Portanto, são ideias que vão continuar uh, e que... Uh, possivelmente vão ser concretizadas uh, para o ano, não é? Portanto, existe uh, este ano o Criatec está, uh, portanto, a expor os trabalhos de alguns dos residentes deste ano, mas também do ano passado. Uh, mas, portanto, o prémio das residências é importante também dizer, e se calhar tu podes dizer mais do que eu, não é? Portanto, sobre isso. Sim, o prémio é um valor monetário de 1.400 euros para cada um dos, dos vencedores. 
uh, apesar de que toda a experiência também nesta, uhum. nesta, neste programa e nesta presidência uh, tem um valor muito superior a uh, esse, valor, esse valor monetário. Uhum. Uh, para nós é muito importante também naquilo que é o roadmap uh, de Aveiro uh, como cidade candidata à capital europeia da cultura em 2027. É muito importante para nós também na vertente da estratégia do Aveiro Tech City, fazer esta ligação da tecnologia e digital com, com o A de, das artes, do, da educação de STEAM, o A das artes. Um, e, portanto, para nós é importante criar isto, esta relação e, e alavancar o nosso, o nosso ecossistema criativo e artístico. Uhum. Sem mais demoras. E agora que já criamos um momento de, de suspense... suspense. Portanto, nós uh, decidimos dar, uh, atribuir o prémio uh, a dois dos projetos uh, deste ano que foram concretizados, penso, com, alguma, com muitos desafios. E a primeira é uma peça interativa e performativa, uh, com o título A Moving Tempo, da Maria Rita Nogueira, que está a ver que está aqui. E a segunda peça é uma peça também interativa, com uma componente sonora e áptica muito importante, um, com o título Ouve-me, da Rita Reis. Bem e, portanto, a peça, a peça da Maria Rita pode ser vista no uh, Atlas. Portanto, eu penso que haverá um horário, uh, porque a artista vai estar mesmo uh, a, a, portanto, a, a, a agir, a intervir com a com as pessoas, ou pelo menos portanto, uma performance que acontecerá X em X tempo, mas é uma peça que também é aberta uh, para uh, o público em geral, portanto, o dispositivo tecnológico que ela própria desenvolveu uh, e que desenvolveu quase todas as suas componentes, desde a componente da programação, a componente visual, a componente performativa, portanto, é um trabalho muito intenso. Uh, e, uh, portanto, tem estas duas possibilidades, onde, por um, la por um lado, está aberta a participação do público por si só, por outro lado, tem essa um, componente de espetáculo que um, a Rita, a Maria Rita, oferece. A peça da Rita Reis estará no Museu da Cidade, portanto, é uma peça sonora, um, portanto, estará disponível o tempo todo, não é? Eu penso que a, a, a Rita estará, estará por lá, para ajudar os espectadores a participarem, mas também para, para esclarecer mais sobre o seu trabalho. Queria relembrar aqui os restantes uh, trabalhos que serão expostos também, uhum. de 14 a 16 de outubro, nos vários espaços de Criatec, Edifício Atlas, Museu da Cidade, uh, Museu Santa Joana e Museu da, da Arte Nova. Exato. Muito obrigado, Patrícia. Ah, uh, e também o um museu, portanto, na nova estação de comboio. Exatamente. Na antiga, antiga estação. <risos> antiga estação. Antiga nova é. estação. Antiga nova estação. <risos> exatamente. Uh, como se costuma dizer também nestas alturas, depois a equipa de produção entrar em contato para reclamarem o, com os vencedores, para reclamarem os, os prémios. Uh, mais uma vez, obrigado por estarem presentes. Relembro que até ao final da semana terão vários eventos no âmbito do Aveiro Tech City. Uh, Tech Days, Criatec e Prisma, nas suas três componentes. Uh, o programa está disponível online. E também dar nota que este ano uh, teremos também a Conferência Artec, uh, que é inaugurada hoje, arranca hoje, uh, no Centro de Congresso de Aveiro, e que tem também uma área expositiva uh, de acesso gratuito ao público em geral. Portanto, podem também visitar uh, essa, essa área de, com instalações artísticas, e algumas festas. Muito obrigado a todos e boa tarde.